Welcome to Gold Coast Arts Cultural Insider Series, where we bring you talks and presentations by the most interesting and dynamic thinkers in the cultural world today. I'm Regina Gill, and it is my pleasure to tell you a little about Rabbi Joseph Telushkin, our featured guest today. Joseph Telushkin, named by Talk Magazine as one of the 50 best speakers in the United States, is the prolific and scholarly author of many books that have been hailed by leading figures in politics, religion, ethics, values, social action, and humor among the topics he has covered in his writings. He has written for television, including programs on PBS, CNN, and ABC TV, um, as well as film. He serves on the Advisory Council and Scholars Council for the World Jewish Museum in Tel Aviv, and he lectures throughout the United States. He's also on the board of directors of the Jewish Book Council. Telushkin has also written Jewish Humor, What the Best Jewish Jokes Say About the Jews. Larry Gelbart, author of MASH and Tootsie, and no stranger to comedy himself, said, quote, I don't know if Jews are really the chosen people, but I think Joseph Telushkin's book makes a strong argument that we're the funniest, unquote. Telushkin appeared in a CNN eight-part documentary on the history of comedy in America, broadcast in early 2017. In August 2017, he was the featured speaker before 1,800 people at the nationally renowned Chautauqua Institution, speaking on the 50 best Jewish jokes and what they show about the human condition. Rabbi Telushkin was ordained at Yeshiva University in New York and pursued graduate studies in Jewish history at Columbia University. He resides in New York City with his wife, Deborah Menashe Telushkin, and they have four children. Ladies and gentlemen, we are proud to present a talk by Rabbi Joseph Telushkin. Ethnic humor is inherently controversial. And the reason is, is because ethnic humor always paints with very broad strokes. In ethnic jokes, there is no such thing as an individual. If a joke begins an Irish guy, there's a very good chance the joke's going to be about drinking. If the punchline to a Jewish joke depended on a Jew drinking too much, people wouldn't laugh, not because there isn't a problem with Jews and drinking, and there is, and we now know that there are many such cases, but the stereotypical image of the Jew is sober. A joke begins an Italian guy. Very likely, it has a connection often to the mob. You know, Rodney Dangerfield said, I used to work in an Italian nightclub that was so tough on the menu they had broken leg of lamb. Where do Jews get it in humor? They get it in the same area in two different ways, jokes about money. One of them I don't understand. The other one I think is a very provocative and interesting thing. The ones I don't understand, there are many jokes about Jews being cheap. That actually I do not believe to be a common Jewish characteristic. I don't think when a Jewish couple walk into a restaurant, uh, the waiters think, uh-oh, I don't want to be served by them. They're not going to give me a decent tip. I think Jews as a group tend to actually be quite generous. The other, though, image of Jews often in humor is as tricksters in business dealings. And this is interesting in how it raises it. For example, in Hebrew, there is no term that is a higher praise than to say of someone that so-and-so is a chacham, so-and-so is a wise man, a scholar. In Yiddish, the word chacham has the connotation of a bit of a trickster. He's a real chacham. It's not a compliment at all. And how did that evolve? And how did that come about? Now, interestingly, the Talmud in says that when we come die and come before the heavenly court, the first question we're going to be asked is, Nasata v'natata bemuna, were you honest in your business dealings? So obviously the fact that they put that in as the first question, and not did you believe in God, not did you fast on Yom Kippur, meant that there was a concern also in that area. And you find it even in internal Jewish joking. People sometimes ask me when I've spoken about Jewish humor before non-Jewish groups, are there jokes I don't tell? Do I give the speech differently? And the answer is, I give the exact same speech as I do before Jewish groups, with one exception, the joke I'm going to tell now. Two Jewish businessmen run into each other on the street, and one says, I heard your business burned down. And the other one says, shh, tomorrow night. 
That joke, I think, is immensely revealing, and I'll tell you why. In many areas, Jews have a very positive self-image. If you hear of Jewish parents who don't care whether their child continues his or her education after high school, we're shocked. There might be such Jewish parents, but the stereotypical image of Jews is we are very, very committed to education. If you hear of a Jewish man who subsequent to his divorce never has contact again with his children, we're shocked. There are some such Jewish men, but our image of ourselves is that we are very devoted to family. If you hear of a Jew committed of a, convicted of a white collar crime, we're not shocked, we're embarrassed. In our own self-image, I'm not saying God forbid we're less honest than others, but in our own self-image, we are not necessarily more honest than others even though we might think we're more committed to education and more committed to family than others. Some Jews get so bothered by that sort of humor that they end up saying they don't want any ethnic jokes at all. A man saying to his friend, one day Cohen and Levine. The friend says, why are your jokes always Cohen and Levine? Tell them about the Chinese. So he says, okay, one day Musu Nu and Ling Su Kang are going to Musu Nu's nephew's bar mitzvah. Obviously, people who believe that all ethnic humor or all ethnic generalizations are false say that all human characteristics are equally distributed among all people. But in order to believe that, you have to believe that culture, religion, and history have no impact on a people. But if culture, religion, and history do have an impact, so certain traits will become more pronounced among certain people. The history of persecution of Jews and of anti-Semitism is not unrelated to another trait that's often attributed to Jews, excessive worry and nervousness. I even remember in 2000 when Joe Lieberman was nominated for vice president, most Jews were very, very pleased. But I came across a not insignificant percentage of Jews who were afraid that having a Jew in such a high profile position could ultimately be bad for the Jews, and if things would go, be going wrong in America, the Jews would be blamed for it. Hence the old definition of a Jewish telegram. A telegram arrives, you open it up, it reads, letter to follow, start worrying. In speaking about Jewish humor, what I wanna do is make clear that the jokes therefore really do reflect Jewish sensibilities. I've picked up books of jokes and have sections on Jewish humor, which weren't funny because what they did was they took standard jokes that could have been told about any group of people and they just gave the characters in it Jewish names. Calling a character Goldstein does not make a joke Jewish, it's the content of the joke that makes it Jewish. So let's look at a number of areas where Jewish humor is really quite pronounced. Probably a favorite aspect of Jewish humor is parent-child relations. And this makes sense. Because Judaism, from its very first legal document, the Aseret wrote, the Ten Commandments, puts parents and children central. In fact, literally central, because the fifth of the Ten Commandments is honor your father and mother. So people will say, so what's the big insight that you're offering? Don't all religions stress parent-child relations? And the answer is no, not, certainly not in their beginning documents. First of all, when you think of cults in the United States, you actually think of trying to drive a wedge between parents and children. And Christianity throughout its history has been a bulwark of support for the family, except for its first generation. Jesus is quoted in the New Testament as saying in the Gospel of Luke, no one can come to me without hating his own father, mother, sister, and brother. And an episode is told in the Gospel of Matthew, a young man comes to Jesus and says, I wanna be your follower, what should I do? And Jesus enumerates several of the Ten Commandments and then concludes, and now follow me. The young man says, but my father has just died. First, I must go home to bury him. And Jesus is cited as saying, let the dead bury the dead. In other words, let the other spiritually dead people in your father's town bury him. You follow me. Obviously, no act would so alienate a child from his parents as not attending the father's funeral. I was once making that point somewhere and somebody challenged me, but isn't it true that God's first commandment to Abraham was to leave his father's house? I said, you're right, it is true. But he was 75 at the time he was entitled. So obviously the good news is that in Jewish humor there, or in Jewish life, there's a big emphasis 
on the cohesion of the family. But humor is not worried about, is not dealing with the good news. Humor deals with what happens when it becomes overly close, overly intense. As in the joke about three elderly Jewish women in Miami Beach talking together, each one bragging about how devoted her son is to her. One says, my son is so devoted. For my birthday last year, he gave me an all expenses paid cruise around the world, first class. The second woman says, my son's even more devoted. For my birthday, he catered a large party here for my friends and even flew down at his own expense, many of my friends from New York to attend it. The third woman says, my son is more devoted than both of your sons. Three times a week, he goes to a psychiatrist. $350 an hour, he pays him. And what does he talk about the whole time? Me. Psychiatry is the subject of actually quite a, a bit of Jewish humor because Jews are disproportionately represented as doctors and were long disproportionately represented even within medical uh, profession uh, in psychiatry as well. The early jokes dealt with the inability of Eastern European Jews to understand these sophisticated new concepts. So a woman has constant explosions in her house with her son. Finally, she brings him uh, to an analyst. After two sessions, the analyst says to the woman, Madam, your son has an Oedipus complex. And the mother says, Oedipus, Schmedipus, as long as he loves his mother. The more recent humor obviously deals with a Jewish community in which many, many people have been in therapy, are in therapy, will be in therapy, are therapists, and is far more sophisticated about what goes on in the therapeutic setting. So a man, for purposes of the joke, we'll call him Goldstein. Goldstein has been in therapy uh, for 10 years, seeing his therapist an average of twice a week. Finally, at the end of 10 years, the therapist says, listen, we've dealt with all of your issues and you really can now analyze everything on your own. You don't really have to keep coming back. Goldstein's thrown into a bit of a panic. Doctor, I'm very dependent on these visits. We can't just stop them. The therapist says, listen, you can do it on your own, but here's my home telephone number. Anything comes up, any sort of feeling of panic or emergency, just call me. Two weeks later, Sunday morning, 6 a.m., the phone rings in the doctor's house. It's Goldstein. What's the matter? He says, doctor, I, I had a nightmare. I dreamt you were my mother and I woke up in a sweat. So the doctor says, so what did you do? He said, well, I sat down and I analyzed it the way you taught me in therapy. What'd you do then? He said, well, I tried to go back to sleep, but I couldn't fall asleep. I was too tense. So I got up and had some breakfast. Doctor says, what'd you have for breakfast? The man said, ah, just a cup of coffee. Doctor says, you call that a breakfast? Words sometimes acquire specialized meanings that are not really intrinsic to the word. For example, the word successful. In theory, the word successful could refer to any number of areas in which a person could be successful. But in spoken American English, the word successful has an exclusively monetary connotation. If you say so-and-so is successful, it means he or she earns a lot of money. Their family life could be in utter disarray. In turn, if you say so-and-so is not successful, it means they are struggling financially, even though every other aspect of their life might be quite impressive. In Yiddish, by the way, the word nachas, which derives from the Hebrew word nachat, uh, could refer to pleasure in many, many different areas. But in spoken Yiddish, it usually refers to children, nachas von kinder, pleasure from children. Two Jewish women haven't seen each other in 20 years. They run into each other on the street, and one says, oh, how is your daughter Deborah doing? The one I remember when she got married to that lawyer. So the first woman says, well, they got divorced. The other woman says, well, I'm sorry to hear that. And then the first woman says, but she then got married to a doctor. And the other one says, Mazel Tov. She said, well, unfortunately, they also got divorced. So now the other woman doesn't say anything. She doesn't know what to say. The woman said, but she's very happy now. She's married to a very successful architect. And the first woman goes, oh, so much nachas from one daughter. Or the birth announcement I once saw in a Jewish newspaper. Mr. and Mrs. Marvin Rosenblum are pleased to announce the birth of their son, Dr. Jonathan Rosenblum. The desire for marriage is true among Jews from many different cultures. Israel 
in its first three years of existence, its population doubled because of two very large migrations. Holocaust survivors, Jews who were then unfortunately in DP camps, displaced person camps, and large migrations of Jews from the Arab world who basically became refugees in the aftermath of Israel's declaration of Israel's becoming an independent country in 1948. Among the Jewish aliyot, among the migrations of Jews to Israel, almost the entire Yemenite Jewish community came to Israel, and many of them claimed very great old ages. You had people who said that they were well over 100 years old. People who even claimed to be 130 or more. And it seemed very hard to believe, uh, particularly hard. Uh, Yemen was a very poor country, did not seem a model of a healthy country. Anyway, a story goes that one day an elderly Jew from Yemen is walking around in Tel Aviv and he sees a sign for a life insurance office. So he walks in, speaks to an agent and says, I want to buy a life insurance policy. The agent sees the man is no youngster. He says, how old are you? 72. He says, you're too old. We can't sell you a policy. The man says, that's not fair. You sold a policy last week to my father. Your father? How old is your father? 95. The agent says, that's impossible. The man says, go check your records. The agent goes into the back, checks his record, sees that the man's 95-year-old father had been examined, found by a doctor to be in perfect health, had been sold a policy, comes out and he says, you're right, we did sell your father a policy, we will sell you one, but you have to come in on Tuesday for a medical checkup. The man says, I can't come in on Tuesday, why not? My grandfather's getting married. The agent's like astounded, your grandfather, how old's your grandfather? 117. 117, why is he getting married? His parents keep pestering him. There are jokes that I excluded uh, from the book I wrote on Jewish humor because I thought that they were hostile and just very unfair. For example, I left out Jap jokes, Jewish American princess jokes, because I do think they were unfair. They, they always had two themes sort of that they focused on. Jewish women as cold, unresponsive partners, and uh, Jewish women as excessively materialistic. And they were very damaging. The truth is the rise of Jap jokes correlates with an enormous increase in intermarriage rates among American Jews. Until 1960 or so, it was assumed that no more than about 6% of American Jews were intermarrying. Intermarriage rates then started to explode. And I don't think it's coincidental that they exploded with the spreading of things like Jap jokes, which the underlying theme of all Jap jokes is the last partner in the world you'd want is a Jewish wife. These are very undermining, and that's why I left them out. I also left out another genre of hostile humor, which are mother-in-law jokes. Mother-in-law jokes are not specifically hostile in the form of Jewish humor, it's hostile humor in general. But there was one Jewish joke that I couldn't leave out because it's so biblical and so therefore so Jewish. Anyway, a story goes that in a certain shtetl in Europe, there are two young women of marriageable age, and there are no appropriate men for them. And so the fathers of the two girls enter into negotiations with the yeshiva about 200 kilometers away, and it's arranged that two young men from the yeshiva are going to be sent to this town for these two girls. The two young men set out, their horse-drawn carriage is attacked by Cossacks, and one of them is killed. And the other man just manages to escape with his life. He arrives in the town, and both mothers immediately insist that he's the destined one for their daughters. The young man really doesn't know exactly what the instructions were. They, he, they bring in finally the local rav, the local rabbi, and the rabbi starts to question the young man, he questions the fathers, he questions the mothers. Finally, in despair, he calls over his assistant, the shamash, and he says to the shamash, bring me a sword, we'll cut the boy in half, each girl will get half. One mother says, you can't do that, you'll kill him, that's terrible. The other mother says, go ahead and cut. The rabbi says, that's the mother-in-law. Another aspect of Jewish culture is that Jewish culture generally was thought of as having verbal fights but not physical fights. 19th century story, a Jewish challenge to a duel. He's forced to accept, but then he says, but if I'm late, start without me. On the other hand, what do Jews do with their anger if they can't discharge it physically? 
they discharge it verbally. Yiddish becomes famous for the ferocity of its curses. May all of your teeth fall out except one, and that should ache you. You know, a typical example, may you grow so rich, your widow's second husband never has to worry about making a living. And the verbal fights, though, uh, become, you know, characteristic of it. I'll give you an example of one. A conservative synagogue's been around for many, many years. And by the way, it's interesting, there are not many jokes about the conservative movement. Because jokes, you remember, as I, as I said earlier, they paint in very broad strokes. So if a joke begins about an Orthodox rabbi, he's usually going to turn out to be very, very unworldly. And if it's about a reform rabbi, he's going to turn out to be very, very secular, you know, the sort where they would claim that on the high holidays, there would be a sign at a synagogue closed for the holidays. You know, these, as I said, humor is not fair. You know, humor paints with these absurdly broad strokes. But conservative Judaism gets fewer jokes because it's in the middle. Anyway, a story goes that at a conservative synagogue, it's been around about 60 years. And every week during the service, there's a fight. They bring in a new rabbi, and the fight takes place when it comes time to recite the Shema. Half of the congregation sits, and half of the congregation stands. Those who sit say, according to Jewish law, if you are seated when it comes time to recite the Shema, you're supposed to remain seated. It had to do with the fact they didn't want Jews saying that certain parts of the Torah are more holy than other parts of the Torah. Anyway, the half of the congregation that stands says, of course we stand for the Shema. It's the credo of Judaism. Jews die with the Shema on their lips, so we stand. Every week, a fight takes place in shul between the two sides. It's driving the new rabbi a little crazy. So finally, he hears that a 99-year-old man at a nearby old age home was a founding member of the synagogue more than 60 years earlier. In accordance with Talmudic tradition, he appoints a delegation of three, one of those who stands for the Shema, one who sits, and the rabbi to go interview the old man. They walk into the room, and the guy who stands for the Shema says, wasn't it the tradition in our congregation to stand for the Shema? And the old man goes, no, that wasn't the tradition. The other guy is delighted. He says, wasn't it the tradition to sit for the Shema? No, that wasn't the tradition. Finally, at this point, the rabbi gets very frustrated and he says to the man, I don't care what the tradition was, just tell them one or the other. You know what goes on in shul every week? The people who are standing yell at the people who are sitting. The people who are sitting yell at the people who are standing. The old man goes, that was the tradition. So the tradition of fighting has been a long one. There's a, a great line about the general lack of physical aggression in Jewish life by the comedian Jackie Mason. Mason says, in this country, Jews don't fight. I don't know if you noticed that. In this country, Jews almost fight. Every Jew I know almost killed somebody. They'll tell you. If he had said one more word, he would have been dead today. That's right. I was ready. One more word. What's the word? Nobody knows what that word is. Many jokes pick up on significant themes in Jewish life, tzedakah being one of them. You know, tzedakah is one of the relatively few Hebrew words that many Jews are familiar with. There aren't that many words. I notice that when I speak to non-Jewish audiences, as opposed to Jewish audiences, I basically can give the exact same speech. There are not many Hebrew words I can use that I don't have to explain to a Jewish audience. But tzedakah happens to be a term that many Jews really are familiar with. And it's considered a characteristic uh, Jewish feature. And the Jewish community wants Jews to know the word tzedakah because they recognize that people who know the word tzedakah are going to be apt to give more charity than people who only know the word charity. Anyway, in Beverly Hills, there's a Jew. I'll use the generic Goldstein again. There's a Jew named Goldstein, very wealthy man never has given a penny to the Jewish Federation. Leadership of the Federation is really angry. They send a delegation of four to go meet with Goldstein. They come in to meet with him and they said, listen, we've been looking into you and into your business. We know that your business opened up 118 new stores this year. We know that you live here in a very large house in Beverly Hills. You have an estate in Palm Springs. You have a chalet in Switzerland. We're expecting you to give and give big. Goldstein isn't phased. He said, really? And in checking into my background, did you find out about my mother? 
who now has been sick for four months, requiring nurses 24 hours a day, and it's not covered by insurance. You have any idea how much that costs? Did you find out about my uncle who's been in a private mental sanitarium for 20 years, not covered by insurance? You have any idea how much that costs? Did you find out about my two sisters, each of whom are married to men who can't hold down jobs, each of whom has two kids in private colleges? You have any idea how much that costs? And if I don't give a penny to any of them, you think I'm gonna help you? Stucca is just so assumed to be so characteristically Jewish that, you know, what's funny is the image of a Jew who really wouldn't give even to his own family. Another common image of Jews, common among non-Jews and Jews as well, is that Jews are bright. Where do we see that sort of in, uh, within, within internal Jewish thinking? Statistically, Jews are about one out of every 500 people in the world. Statistically, therefore, one Jew should win one Nobel Prize about every 30 years. Yet how many of you in any given year, if there are no Jewish winners of a Nobel Prize, assume that it's anti-Semitism? Many Jews do. And many Jews do look. I mean, I'm curious if you're among them, those of you, my listeners here, who do check every year and want to hear the names of the Nobel Prize winners and want to hear if you hear Jewish names about, about them if you hear Jewish names mentioned when their names are given. Interestingly, no shortage of anti-Semites also believe Jews are brighter. The difference is though, they believe that the Jews use their intelligence in a malevolent manner. Martin Luther, who unfortunately, you know, he played a very major role in the history of Christianity. Unfortunately though, he developed a tremendously deep anti-Semitism, mainly because he thought that Jews should convert to his uh, brand of Christianity, and he was so angry when they didn't. Luther said Jews are so proficient in the use of poisons that they can kill someone in five minutes or in five years. And in 1610, the medical faculty at the University of Vienna, Vienna certified as its official opinion that Jewish law required Jewish doctors to kill one out of 10 of their Christian patients. Can you imagine what it must have been like to be in a Jewish doctor's office with nine people in front of you? Anyway, Jews also believed that they were brighter. In fact, I've often speculated that there were two groups of people who believed that Jews were brighter than other people, anti-Semites and Jews. Early 1900s, Jews traveling on the Trans-Siberian Railroad, he's alone in his compartment. Suddenly, the train pulls to a stop. An officer in the Tsar's army gets on the train, sits down opposite the Jew. The train starts to move. He suddenly grabs the Jewish guy by the lapels and says, tell me, why are you Jews brighter than everybody else? Jew's taken aback. He doesn't know what to say. Finally, he says, it's because of the herring we eat. Chain, train continues on its way. A few minutes later, the Jewish guy takes out some herring and starts to eat it. The officer says, how much do you want for, that, for, that, for a dozen pieces of that herring? Jew says 20 rubles, big sum of money. The officer gives him 20 rubles, the Jew gives him the herring, the officer takes one bite of the herring, and then he looks at the Jew suspiciously and he says, wait, I, in Moscow I could have gotten all these herring for a few cupcakes." And the Jew says, you see, it's working already. Sigmund Freud wrote one of the first attempts at a scientific analysis of humor called Jokes and Their Relation to the Unconscious. And Freud was very aware of Jewish humor. In fact, according to Ernest Jones, who was Freud's main early biographer, Freud at one point actually wanted to write a book on Jewish humor, but didn't feel he had enough material. But a lot of the material that he did have, he did incorporate into his book, Jokes and Their Relationship to the Unconscious. Freud says that he knows of no other people who were so willing to make fun of their own weaknesses as the Jews were. And that actually is true, except in one genre, and that's the genre of jokes about anti-Semitism, because that was one of the only weapons they had. It was a tool to fight and point out the absurdity of what, what anti-Semites were doing. I remember I became cognizant of this many, many years ago, almost 50 years ago, when as a very young man, uh, I visited with dissidents in, the, uh, in what was now, what's now called the former Soviet Union. And they loved telling jokes, making fun of the communist regime. 
Brezhnev, who was then the head of Russia, uh, announces in a speech, by the year 2000, every Soviet family will have its own airplane. And somebody calls out and says, Comrade Brezhnev, why does every family need its own airplane? And he looks at them and he says, fool, suppose you live in Moscow and you hear that they have potatoes in Kiev. Or another joke I heard from Robert Toth. Robert Toth was the Los Angeles Times correspondent who was expelled from the Soviet Union on the accusation that he was Natan Sharansky's CIA connection. Toth told me of a joke he had heard when he was working uh, for the LA Times in, in, in the Soviet Union. 1970, Brezhnev announces he's gonna pay a state visit to Poland. And he wants to bring a gift to the Polish people. And the gift that he wants to bring is a large painting of Lenin, the god of Soviet communism in Poland. Problem was Lenin wasn't in Poland. And when a painting, Lenin in Poland is commissioned from the Union of Soviet Socialist Artists, they can't come up with anything. Constricted by their notions of socialist realism, they cannot come up uh, with any worthwhile painting. They're growing desperate. The trip is growing near. Uh, it's only three weeks away. So they go to Rabinovich, a dissident artist, and they say to Rabinovich, you have been a troublemaker and you've gotten into a lot of trouble. But if you do this for the motherland, if you agree to make this painting of Lenin in Poland, we'll forgive your past transgressions. You'll be given a very nice apartment. You'll be given your own studio. Rabinovich accepts. Three weeks later, the day before the trip, Brezhnev leads the Supreme Soviet leadership into a room. They sit down at a table. Rabinovich is standing in the front, in, in front of a painting covered by a large drop cloth. Brezhnev says, let's see the painting. He takes off the drop cloth and they all gasp. It's a painting of a man in bed with a woman. And one of them calls out, who is that man? He says, Trotsky, the great heretic of, of, of Russia. And then somebody says, and who is that woman? Krupskaya, Lenin's wife. Brezhnev is apoplectic. Where is Lenin? Lenin's in Poland. Lenin in Poland is, of course, the perfect joke to be told against the totalitarian regime. It's not enough to tell lies. They try and produce documentary evidence of the lies. Jews and Christianity is a sensitive subject. Jews, obviously, throughout much of history, were really persecuted in the Christian world. Today's very different. They're it's particularly very different in the United States, where there was a great openness and acceptance of Jews. But that historically, of course, was not the case. So Jews were very careful in speaking about humor in not directing it directly against Christianity. I mean, you come, sometimes you would see it. You know, I remember I once saw Jules Pfeiffer saying, Christ died for our sins. Dare we mock his martyrdom by not committing them. But in general, Jews directed their animus against Jews who converted to Christianity. So they tell a story in the 1930s, a Jew wants to get into a country club and he can't get in because he's Jewish. So he converts and applies for membership. They ask him, what's your name? He gives one of those pompous names like Hutchinson River Parkway III. What do you do for a living? Well, I own a seat on the New York Stock Exchange. He looks like a shoe in for membership. One last question, sir, what is your religion? My religion, why I am a goy. Because Jews were not by and large converting in order to become Christians. They were converting to become goyim, to become part of the majority. The word goy, by the way, which is a word Jews should not use, is not an inherently nasty word. The word goy in Hebrew simply means a nation. And the Torah even refers to Jews as goyim. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. But it became, as it evolved, a somewhat hostile term. Or I'll put it to you a different way. When people ask me, is a term wrong to use? I say to them, if you're speaking in English and you then go out of your way to refer to another group by a non-English term, it is probably not a term of endearment. But obviously in this joke, it works. When he says, but my religion, why I am a guy? Because it underscored Jews really weren't becoming Christians. They, didn't un they really didn't understand it. And non-Jews were often sensitive about this issue. A young Jewish boy and a Catholic boy become great friends. They're constantly over at each other's houses. During the Christmas season, the young Jewish kid, Jakey, is at his friend's house. And, but suddenly, when the father looks out the window, 
he sees uh, the Catholic boy's father leading his Jakey back, obviously furious at him, and uh, comes to the door. He says, we don't want Jakey coming to our house anymore. My father, the, father, the Jewish father says, why? What did he do? He said, he makes fun of our religion. He says, my Jakey wouldn't do that. Yes, he does do it. He asks questions. He tries to make everything we do look ridiculous. So the father said, what did he ask? He said, he looked at our Christmas tree and he said, does it have to be a pine tree or can it be a different tree? Uh, how tall is your, uh, how tall does it have to be? Uh, the decorations you hang on it, is that legally that you have to do that according to Christian law or is it just a custom? And of course that joke really highlights and explains what the Talmud is. It's an adjective joke because the Talmud just takes the laws of the Torah and tries to work out what do they mean in specific terms. But Christianity, which became a faith-based religion, not a law-based religion, to them it just looked like he was trying to mock it. It's funny, I remember years ago uh, thinking when I lived in Israel, I was quite young, as I think many of us were when the Six Day War happened. Uh, and obviously most people today were not really around. Uh, we're not around yet uh, when the Six Day War happened. But I remember the jokes that were told about Israel in the aftermath of the Six Day War clearly were by and large made up by American Jews and reflected American Jewish motifs. Golda meets with Nixon. Nixon says to Golda, we want General Dayan. And Golda says, okay, we'll give you Dayan. You give us General Motors, General Telephone, and General Electric. Obviously, obviously based on American uh, on baseball trades. And, and how trades were done. An Egyptian tankist and an Israeli tankist collide in the Sinai. The Egyptian tankist jumps out of his tank and says, I surrender. The Israeli jumps out and yells, whiplash. Or Moshe Dayan uh, is asked at a press conference, didn't you promise that in return for peace, you'd give back all the territories? And Dayan says, I did make that promise, but the territories are now all registered in my wife's name. So all of these obviously reflect these American motifs and were more apt to be made as tools because we were all quite petrified just before the Six Day War. Israelis were, in general rule, a little more self-confident. Israelis would make jokes about areas where they felt helpless, like the story they tell. Any of you who've been to Israel, and I suspect many, many of you have been, you know, know that the driving there is quite hazardous. Anyway, a story goes that on the same day, uh, a bus driver in Israel and a Talmudic scholar both die. The bus driver is immediately admitted to heaven. The Talmudic rabbi is told that his case has to be investigated. He's furious. He says, do you know who I am? Do you know that every day on earth I gave a class, a shear in Talmud? That bus driver I know was a totally non-observant Jew. And the angel says to him, rabbi, it is true that every day you gave a class in Talmud. And some people learned and many people slept. When that man drove his bus, everybody prayed. Another aspect of Jewish humor is not distinctive to Jewish humor. It's common characteristic of all forms uh, of humor. It's the absurdist humor. The absurdist humor, which contrasts the perfection of a world that God created with the imperfection of the world as it actually happens. Remember many years ago hearing the Catholic actor, Pat O'Brien was telling a story uh, a Catholic priest was giving his sermon, and he was saying, every man in this parish must die one day. And everybody's looking very solemn, but he sees this one man laughing. So he thinks the guy didn't really hear him. So he turns to the fellow who was laughing, and he says again, I said every man in this parish must die one day. The man continues to laugh. He says, what are you laughing about? He says, because I'm not from this parish. But the absurdist humor, you know, we continue to see in a variety of ways. A Jewish grandmother is wheeling her grandson in a baby carriage, and the woman stops her and says, oh, what a beautiful baby. And the grandmother says, this is nothing. You should see his pictures. A rabbi is at the cemetery. He's just performed uh, a funeral, and he's about to leave. But at a distance, he sees a woman standing in front of a grave and crying and crying. And as he gets nearer, he could hear what she's saying. Why did you have to die? Why did you have to die? And the rabbi feels so terrible. And he walks over to the woman and he says to her, who died? And she says, my husband's first wife. <laughs>
That was a little darker, the humor. I've come across some Jewish haiku. Somebody actually published some of the haiku. Seven foot Jews in the NBA slam dunking. My alarm clock rings. Left the door open for the prophet Elijah. Now our cat is gone. Years ago, I don't remember the man's name. I heard a stand-up comic uh, say, my wife has trust issues. I know that. She writes about it in her diary. And I remember noticing many years ago that there are certain English words, which if you didn't know they were English, you would assume were Yiddish, like far-fetched, far-flung. I remember years ago, a man told me that what made it so hard for him to learn English were the idioms. I said, like, what are you thinking of in particular? He said, ever since I found out that fat chance means the same thing as slim chance, I've just simply given, given up on learning it. And here's a story that I always thought was just a joke, uh, but I heard it from the person himself. Uh, I'm no Senator Lieberman, and, uh, and we were once speaking at a conference. At, it wasn't a conference. It was an event for Chabad where his wife was being honored and I had been asked to speak and then Senator Lieberman spoke and he told the story of how in the year 2000 he had assumed he was going to become the American vice president. The early returns in the 2000 election uh, with him and Gore seemed to indicate that Gore and Lieberman were going to win the election and then of course they didn't and Lieberman says when he came down to breakfast the next morning he was in a pretty low mood he was envisioning what a life he was going to have, and instead he was out. And so his wife reassured him, his wife Hadass, and says to him, Joe, don't worry. In this household, you will always be vice president. Is there anything that unites all of Jewish humor? It's too broad a topic. I mean, we look at what we've looked at, issues on anti-Semitism, issues on parents and the family, the aversion to physical aggression. So I don't think you can see it all united in any one theme. But there are two jokes, I think, that summarize a good part of Jewish humor. The first is set in the late 1940s. When Israel was established, airplane travel was much more primitive. And it was very hard to get to Israel and to get from Israel to the United States. So you didn't so routinely have Israeli leaders coming over to the United States. So when a big Israeli leader arrives, a large delegation of Jews come to greet him at what was then called Idlewild Airport. Today, of course, that's JFK. And he gets out of the plane and somebody calls out in great excitement. So tell us what the situation is like in Israel in one word. And he says, good. So then somebody else says, okay, in two words. He says, not good. <laughs> in that regard, Jewish humor so typifies uh, the whole human condition. And it, it not only is it good and not good, you know, in different frames of time, on any given day, we're optimistic and or pessimistic, you know, how it can happen. And a second joke that I remember hearing when I lived in Israel, a group of elderly Jewish men, Israelis, uh, every morning gather together at a cafe and they sort of share breakfast and talk about the world situation. And given the nature of the world situation, their talks are very often quite downbeat. One day, one of the men in the group shocks them all and says, you know what, I'm an optimist. They were all taken aback. But then one man notices something a little fishy. He says, wait a second, if you're an optimist, why do you look so worried? He says, you think it's easy to be an optimist? That story strikes the keynote of Jewish humor. Judaism and its insistence that the world is moving towards messianic redemption is optimistic. Jewish history filled as it is with pogroms, with persecutions, with expulsions is pessimistic. Because of Judaism, we're optimists. Because of Jewish history, we're pessimists. Hence, we end up as optimists with worried looks on our faces. Thank you very much.